Um, but welcome and thank you so much for joining us uh, for this Welcome to the Midland Charities Forum as our new partner at the Vision for Volunteering. I'm assuming if you've joined today, you know a little bit about the vision already, um, but I'm just going to give you a quick whistle-stop tour of who we are, um, why we're doing what we're doing. So we are the Vision for Volunteering. Uh, we're essentially a 10-year collaborative project designed to create a better future for volunteering. And I'm just letting a couple more people in. Bear with me two seconds. Fabulous. Great. So if you've just joined, I'm just doing a quick introduction before I hand over. Um, so the Vision is a 10-year collaborative project. We're designed to create a better future for volunteering. We are made of seven different partners. Um, so we are a partnership project. We're very early on in the process. So we started in 2022. Obviously, this is our first year. So doing a lot of groundwork and a lot of research and figuring out exactly where we can make the most impact. Um, the seven partners in the partnership are the National Council for Voluntary Organisations, we've got ABM, we've got NAVCA, Volunteering Matters, Sports England, DCMS and of course Muslim Charities Forum who joined us in the summer. I think we worked out it was about June or July didn't we? <laughs> um, that joined us as part of our partnership board so we sort of have regular meetings to sort of decide what the vision is going to do and how we, again how we can make the most impact. And so what is the vision for volunteering? Um, the vision for volunteering is a view of what volunteering could and should look like by 2032. So over the next nine years now, I guess, um, and we're a collaborative grassroots focus project designed to help you think about what works and doesn't work for, for you in volunteering, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're a volunteer manager, whether you sort of work in the sector, um, it's for everyone essentially. And what we're trying to do is identify where volunteering does and doesn't work, like go of uh, ways of working and tech that doesn't really serve us anymore and find out how we can experiment and improve um, and also what the barriers to doing that are so there are a lot of barriers things like resource and money and time are all really things we hear really commonly from people in our feedback that we would like to improve the way that we work um, but it's not always possible so what we're really trying to do at the moment is identify what those barriers are and help people to overcome them uh, and as I talk through sort of what our themes are in a second it'll be really great if you have a think about what of these themes resonates with you um, and how they resonate with you because again we find every organization and every volunteer is different and a lot of these things will resonate in a very different way depending who you are and what you do um, and so the vision is quite broad and that is by design it's to give you the room and the thinking space to think okay that that is something that needs to improve and that this is how that affects me and this is how I think I can make a change there what the vision for volunteering isn't is a rigid structure it's not a set of rules that we've written that you have to uh, sort of subscribe to um, it's not being imposed upon you you can pick and choose what works and doesn't work for you um, but essentially we're trying to be quite broad in order to make as much impact in as many different places and as many different communities and organizations as possible and um, that's a quick whistle stop of what the vision for volunteering is and what we do why is the vision needed uh, volunteering currently isn't accessible or equally enjoyable for everybody we've seen so many changes happen to volunteers and their activities during the COVID-19 pa pandemic. Not all of these changes were positive and the ones that were positive, a lot of them haven't been permanent. So a lot of things have reverted back to old ways of working since people have started going back to work. Um, and we've also seen changing patterns in who volunteers and how and in what activities and roles. Uh, so we've done a lot of research. We've spoken to 300 different organizations, over 350 people we've been doing sort of workshops we've been doing um, feedback sessions and finding out sort of over the last year or two um what exactly are people struggling with in volunteering what does need to improve where are these barriers what what do we need to overcome so from all of that research we've created these five key themes um, and again I'd like you to really have a think about these uh, and how they directly affect you and it might not be in the way that you expect first of all um, so things like awareness and appreciation um, so when we talk about awareness and appreciation we're not talking just about giving someone a gift card if they're a volunteer or throwing a dinner for them as much as those things are really important it's really that awareness and appreciation for the difference that that volunteer makes and helping them to appreciate that difference that they make as well and it sort of leads into the next one which is power um one of our themes is power which we think that it's really important to hand power 
to the people who are affected by and are passionate about the causes that they're volunteering for. We find people volunteer for causes that mean a lot to them um, and to offer them the power to make a change and make a difference is so, so important. I think that's how real change gets made. Um, equity and inclusion obviously has been a, a huge discussion topic and is a, so important whether we're talking about people from different backgrounds and different communities whether we're talking about people who have caring responsibilities and can't work in the or volunteer in a structured way or on a regular basis and um, whether it's people who are disabled and need those accessibility considerations in their volunteering there's there's so many different ways we can look at equity and inclusion it's such an important topic to make sure that volunteering is accessible for everybody um, looking at collaboration and today's obviously a really important and really great example of that and that we are collaborating with seven different partners so we're sort of leading by example with that collaboration and that we can work together on this vision but that might be collaboration between volunteers it might be collaboration between a volunteer and an organization it might be a collaboration between organizations but really sort of working together and sharing that knowledge and not working in silos um, and finally experimentation which I think I mentioned a little bit at the beginning so talking about and thinking about how we can let go of the ways of working that don't serve us and let go of some of the technology maybe that doesn't serve us and how we can sort of improve that and try things and give ourselves the room to fail and give ourselves the room to try something that maybe it doesn't work and now we know and we can learn from that. And again, a lot of these things, great in theory, and there's a lot of barriers to face when we try and overcome those barriers and try and overcome those things. And what the vision is trying to do is identify those barriers in collaboration with volunteers and with volunteering involving organizations and figuring out how we can overcome those as well. Um, if you are interested in learning more about any of those things, there is a lot of information on our website about our upcoming events. Um, you can follow us on social media and join our newsletter. But for now, that is enough from me. Today, we are here to celebrate the Muslim Charities Forum joining the Vision for Volunteering as one of our newest partners. So I am going to hand over now to Barish, who is going to talk you through Muslim Charities Forum and what they do and a little bit more about them. So Barish, please take it away. Thank you very much, Georgia. Um, just before I begin, can everybody hear me? Fantastic. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, as mentioned, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, Vision for Volunteering, thank you very much for hosting us. Uh, we're happy to be a part of this partnership and happy to you know, present and talk about what Muslim Charity Forum is, what we do, who we are, and sort of why volunteering is important for us. And we believe it's important to champion the cause. Um, before I uh, begin with the actual content, it would be good to sort of provide you with an overview. So there are, don't get scared, there are three parts of this presentation, but we are going to have breaks. We are going to make it interactive. I'm not really much of a didactical person where um, it's just like one person presenting. Not really for that, to be honest. My wife's the young teacher of the family. I'm not. And that's what she specializes in. Uh, I'm sure she'll have plenty of feedback for me after my presentation. Um, but I like to make it actually interactive and engaged. So um, both sides get to learn and get to take away something from each other. So like part one, what and who is MCF? The MCF membership, the who's who, some of the strengths and the challenges we have as the British Muslim charitable and voluntary sector. And then we'll move on to why volunteering actually matters for Muslims, um, Muslim volunteering in the UK, and then talk about British Muslim social action. And then finally, talk about the vision for volunteering. So why volunteering matters to MCF specifically, um, the role of vision for volunteering, so our journey so far, and how we feed into the vision and the themes. But let's start with this guy. So my name is Barish Vali. I'm the National Emergencies and Members Engagement Coordinator for the Muslim Charities Forum. I'm also an Aziz scholar. I'm a pr proud Soassian. Um, I studied MSc Development Studies there, and I'm a local trustee at my mosque, which is uh, Makwas. Now, what is MCF? I have a nice little QR code for you to our website. Please do scan it, have a look. Um, go into the, the resources, some of the news, some of the articles that we've um, shared, some of our blog posts. But essentially, we are the UK network for British Muslim charities and organisations working for social good in the UK and abroad. Um, some of you may actually be aware of MCF already. Um, we predominantly used to focus on INGOs. That was sort of our forte, um, taking their sort of advocacy, their research needs into priority. But over the last few years, especially during COVID, we decided to sort of shift that focus. Um, we no longer only just work with INGOs. We also work with local INGOs as well as nationwide British Muslim INGOs. Pardon me. 
and that shift sort of happened after COVID when we saw the British Muslim social action really come to the fore forefront and really shine. And uh, it was a it was hard times, yes, but we really saw those local organisations coming together, volunteers, and it was something that was I've personally never seen it before, where people were able to put differences aside, sit on the same table together, and actually work for social good. Um, and that's what MCF essentially wants to do. It wants to kind of ensure collaboration and ensure the good work and actually show it off a bit. So what is our vision? Our vision is to collectively build, and I've highlighted this uh, specifically, collectively, um, individuals themselves, they can maybe start the building process, but actually completing the building requires collective effort. Build a more accountable, transparent, and efficient British Muslim charitable and voluntary sector. Um, efficiency, I don't think I need to expand on why that's important, but to be transparent and accountable, I think that's something very important where, especially in our current society, there's a lot of malarkey that takes place. And um, one of the things that as MCF we want to focus on is definitely ensuring that everything is transparent and that boards are accountable, the individuals are accountable, not just to the actual trustees and the people that have certain stakes within an organisation, but to the actual people working there, in particular volunteers. Because we believe that they're the backbone of all organisations, especially the VCS. And our mission is to support, connect and to represent the sector. The sector being the small sector, which is the Muslim charity, charity space. In and then we build that sort of um, communication and that link with the mainstream. But how do we do this? So as MCF, um, we have four main lines of work. That is ensuring that we produce accessible resources that are valuable to Muslim communities in particular. Um, there are certain cultural considerations that we need to have, such as language barriers, um, lack of trust when it comes to certain institutions. And we want to ensure to sort of make the process as seamless as possible by creating valuable resources for them. Research and advocacy. Um, this branch of work was something that, as I mentioned, was purely for INGOs before and international um, development work. But now we've decided to focus on more domestic affairs as well, where we are now um, working with local organizations, getting information from them, doing needs assessments, understanding what their challenges are. Um, recently, we've done some research into donor behavior and we've given this information, we made it public. Um, normally, we would keep this information for our members only, but we decided to disseminate it public-wide um, so people can be aware of what's actually going on and how donors feel. And other charities, even the ones outside of our membership, as a part of our network, also have access to, to this information because we believe that it's actually crucial. And we also provide training. Um, the training that we provide is quite niche, so MCF itself doesn't really give training. We provide it. So think of us as the connector. If we believe that somebody is the leader in safeguarding or the leader in HR, we connect the Muslim charity or the Muslim organization to that organization or to that charity or to that company. Um, we, the reason why we believe that that should be the case is that like all organizations, Muslim organizations should have access to the very best facilitators and they should also be the very best people. They should have access to those people, but actually take the skills and take the procedures and the process on board and implement it to their own organizations. And finally, networking. Um, our motto is blessings of the collective. I'm not sure if any of you heard of Muslim Charities Convention. I know Georgia has, she was there. Um, but our objective is to bring as many people together to enjoy the blessings, the, the blessings of being Muslim, the blessings of being a part of the um, UK, to be a part of the collective and to promote good. Um, that's what we believe in, encourage and spread the application of good practice. Now, our membership. I've got a little game for you guys, something to make it a little bit more interactive. Do you know or can you guess any of our members? I'll give everybody five minutes. If you just put it into the chat box or just shout them out. What's the hands? Yep, yeah, that's one of our members. Thank you, Chris. NDC, no. I actually haven't heard of NDC. And please don't cheat. Please don't Google our membership now. Don't, don't use the QR code that I gave you guys earlier to find out who our members are. Don't be cheeky. NDC. 
any other members come to mind? Some of the bigger charities, maybe. No other guesses? SRC, Red Crescent, no, no. Red Crescent's uh, quite an interesting one because they actually um, are government affiliated. So for example, every Muslim country will have its own version of the Red Crescent. So Turkey will have its own, Syria will have its own, Egypt will have its own. So we um, only focus on British based. Yes, Islamic Republic is another one, Chris. Exactly, that's usually the example that everybody gives established in 1984, the largest Muslim charity in the Western world. Uh, yep, Islam, really thank you very much, Nikki. Um, SRC, no, uh, I'm assuming that's a affiliate of um, Red Crescent as well. So, Red Crescent, like I mentioned, is government affiliated. Okay, Scottish Refugee Council, no, but maybe they could be somebody to have on board. Muslimin, Muslimin is, is an interesting one. Muslimin sort of comes in and then drops out and then comes in and drops out. It really depends on what mood they're in during, during, during those during those few years and depending on what executive new leadership go through. But Muslim Aid is definitely a very valued member of the um, British Muslim charity and voluntary space. And we do work with them quite closely. So when something happens internationally, so in the recent um, issues that we are facing in Palestine, um, we've spoken to them to see what their capacity is like on the ground, some of the challenges that they're facing. Previously, with the earthquakes that took place in Morocco, um, and even before that with the Turkey and Syria earthquake, and we have definitely collaborated with them and worked with them. Scottish Refugee Council was quite an interesting one, actually. They may be a good person for me to reach out to myself. And if there is anybody here that can connect me with them, that would be fantastic. Okay, I think I'll move on and just reveal who they are. So here are our 16 core members. We have African Relief Fund, Islamic Help, Muslim Hands, Human Relief Foundation, Goodwill Caravan, Reed Foundation, uh, Islamic Relief, Human Appeal, Muslim Charity, Lady Fatima Trust, National Zakat Foundation, Omar Welfare Trust, African Development Trust, Dean Relief, as well as the Al-Sayed Foundation. Now, that was a lot of names. Uh, I'm happy not to be representing NCBO right now. It'd be like a list of 24,000 <laughs> charities. Uh, we just have 16 core members and the list is growing. Um, as you can see, um, Islamic Relief, Human Nepal, Umar Welfare Trust, Muslim Hands, these are some of the founders of the actual sector, the Muslim charity and voluntary sector. And then you also have some newcomers in there, such as um, Goodwill Caravan, uh, as well as National Zakat Foundation, who focus purely on domestic affairs. Um, so it's one of the own, it is the only national Zakat institution that we have in the UK, and they do some fantastic work. Islamic Relief, is globally known human appeal all the same, as well as Muslim Hands, some charity and Umar Welfare Trust, and some of our other, other niche organizations that focus on particular regions, such as African Development Trust and African Relief Fund. And we have some other sort of mid-range um, char charities in that they're having sort of crossed about uh, 100 million or between 50 and 100 million, such so as Islamic Help, um, so as a Muslim charity. They are quite, they have a very loyal, loyal base and they have a lot of support and they do some fantastic work, as well as in relief. Um, but if you know any of them or you'd like to get in touch with them, please let me know and we can definitely arrange something. And you can always, if, you, if you're a Muslim organization and you want to be a part of it, there's always like a little link below for you to become a member. Now, there are some strengths, some challenges as be of being a Muslim organization operating in the UK. Um, would anybody like to throw some out there or can anybody guess some? Let's start off with the strengths, mate, maybe. By the way, is if anybody is willing to sort of have like a nice conversation about some of the strengths and challenges, I'm more than happy to. So if anybody wants to want to meet themselves. Or you can just put it in the chat box. Yeah, can reach groups with other charities may struggle to support and engage with. Fantastic. Faith-based giving and service, strong sense of community. Yep, I would agree with all of these strengths. Um, I think the first one is a quite interesting point, the point by Samantha. Um, MCF is definitely one of those organizations where the community does trust. Um, are we sort of 
the leading charity or the leading sort of coalition of, or an umbrella organization that's leading that. I would personally argue so. Um, there are lots of organizations that say that they represent the community and they give a very um, blanket understanding of what the community look like. But the community isn't very homogenous and no community is, especially not uh, when you're talking about around 10 million people. Um, it's not homogenous. There are different um, diaspora dynamics. There are identity dynamics such as different dominant um, dominations of faith and um, denominations of faith. Uh, and I think we're one of the few organizations that actually um, has those links, at least even if it's not a deep connection with those communities, at least we facilitate certain conversations to take place regardless of what kind of Muslim they are. And I think this is very important because especially in, in recent uh, recent occasions and recent um, contexts, we've seen a lot of organizations not work with each other due to certain views and preferences. Um, we are personally not, not far that we are non-sectarian. And we want to make sure that it stays that way so we can facilitate niche conversations and actually have a, we don't want to be stuck in an echo chamber, but essentially I think is what I'm trying to say. Build relationships and connections, understanding of key issues. Dave, I would like to elaborate on what, what you exactly mean by understanding of key issues. I think that's a good point. But if you want to expand and maybe explain, explain yeah. that point. Go, go on, yeah. Well, I was thinking both the kind of the, the challenges and the opportunities. So having yeah. like, insight into what's really going on in different communities uh i've been able to bring together a bit of a collective voice uh, and kind of kind of looking at you know what the challenges that people are facing what are the individual sort of charities facing as challenges what are some of the common sort of trends but also what are the opportunities because yeah, yeah. it's kind of looking at it in both in both ways but it's having that specialist knowledge and, and insight. Yeah, but that's Dave. Um, where, where are you based on what organisation you're from? Uh, I'm from Voluntary Action in Leicestershire, in Leicester. Oh, then you're in a perfect location, yeah. right? Plenty of Muslims there. Mashallah, yeah. a very good representation of our Gujarati community in in, um, in in Leicester in particular. So yeah, I think I think I agree with you on that one. Um, understand, keep great community, build relationships and connections. Fantastic. So let's move on to some of the challenges. Um, I think there there are a lot of challenges, and some of them are internal, some of them are external. Can anybody in name name some or throw some out there? Dave, would you like to go first, maybe? Well, I can give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> go um, for it, I suppose um, on the flip side of that, you've got that collective voice, but I guess some of the challenges are that each charity is going to have different focuses and kind of different things yep. going on. So how do you how do you bring that together, and how do you kind of marry together those different perspectives and different viewpoints in a, yeah. in a constructive way. Yeah, fantastic. I think um, just like any other relationship, right, including marriage, communication is key. I think it's about listening to the other side, at least giving them a platform to voice their opinion. So, and the challenge that Muslim Charity Forum has, we have a lot of large charities as well as small charities. And sometimes the larger charities um, like to sort of swing their muscle around, I, I, as you do. You want your, your objectives to be prioritised and your mission to be prioritised. That's fine. But just because you have a, a large following or a large um, donor base doesn't give you the right to sort of voice your opinions only. You get to voice your, voice your opinion 100%, but definitely this is a collective function. There needs to be a sort of both sides need to listen to each other, even if they disagree on fundamental points. We need to come to some sort of consensus. And this is where I think it helps being very diplomatic. And I think sometimes people mistake diplomatic with being silent. We're definitely not silent. There are, I think you need to know when to speak and who to speak to at the right time. And I think that's where MCF is definitely. So the funders who want fund religious charities, that's a fantastic point. Um, religion is quite taboo. Uh, and it's it's quite interesting. I've, I've been in the sort of the voluntary space for since the beginning of my career, actually. Um, and religion has always seems to be a taboo topic, even in academic literature, because it's always synonymous with proselytizing. Right? Um, religious charities only exist to convert people into their various faiths or their denomination within their faiths, and that may be certainly the case for some organisations. And I'll be honest, I don't think Muslim charities are really free from that. I think anybody who seeks to do good wants to do good for a particular purpose. Um, for Muslims, sometimes that is um, due to proselytization, 
of going to, for example, certain religions, um, certain regions in the world, such as maybe Africa or South Asia, there may be hotspots for these sort of activity. Um, am I pro this, against this? I'm not too sure, to be honest with you. I understand it. I get it. But in the UK, I don't think that is the case. So a lot of the organisations working in the UK, I think, genuinely want to help the people here, especially post-COVID. I think there are a lot of gaps um, institutionally, and definitely the charities and organisations um, have come together and actually assist the UK society, society, and that's been their focus. And I don't think there's been a sort of a proselytization agenda there, per se. If anything, maybe um, a lot of all community wounds will actually heal through that sort of collective help and effort. I think up north, one of our members, there was actually a no-go zone for Muslims. And um, during COVID, there was no other organisations to help them other than the local mosques, as well as some of the local char charities. So when those sort of Muslims with the shawar and kameez went there, they were shocked, like, what are you doing here? They were just there to like, just to serve some food to them. And they were shocked, like, why would you help us? I mean, we've been rivals for so long with had some communal differences. Uh, look, we're just here to help you guys. Look, it's a tough time. Just take what you need. If you need anything, just give us a shout. And through that, actually, now that community is actually doing quite well. Um, I wish I could um, give the name because the individual told me to uh, keep it sort of private, but that's just one example of many. And I think one of the things that MCF is great at is giving voice to the voiceless who may be shy to talk about these topics and to they don't want to show off per se. They want to sort of remain humble and to sort of keep that uh, within them and their community. Islamophobia. Yes, Islamophobia is one of those hot topics that we face I, I don't know, think of like a domain that we don't face Islamophobia in. Um, recently, I was at, a, at, a, at an event where somebody said that, oh, it's okay um, for Muslim organizations to not, be, to not be given funding because of certain activities that happen abroad. And I just thought to myself, really? Like, you genuinely have that, have that opinion. Um, but they're more happy with some of the more mainstream ch charities operating there. So really like what was going on there i was i was very surprised to be honest with you resource time and money yes i think this point of resource time and money isn't something that's just specific to muslim organizations but there is a maybe an additional challenge given the majority of our community is from the ethnic community and majority of, of our jobs are in the informal sector so even the fact that we have time to volunteer and give time and our, and our resources, it really goes to show the generosity of the Muslim community in the UK. Um, if I was to just give some strength on my end, um, the Muslim community is quite interesting in that it is one of the most economically deprived, yet one of the most generous. And I think the Muslim charity charities definitely um, reflect that when you see Islamic belief in, and the amount that is able to fundraise you see some of the charities up north, such as Omar Welfare Trust and Human Appeal and the map that they're able to raise. It's definitely a big strength to have. Um, and I'm really uh, amazed to see you guys actually identify some of those strengths and challenges, which is always going to see. I think the challenges you guys have already sort of mentioned. But yeah, uh, I think that's definitely fantastic. So moving on. Now, big question. Do you guys want to throw some questions my way? I'll take a 10 minute break before we move on to the next section. Let's have a, have a little vote. If you'd like to ask some questions, just raise, raise your hand if you want to take a 10 minute break, just mention, keep going. Okay, Chris wants to keep going. If everybody just upvotes, Chris, if you want to keep going. Keep going, Dave wants to keep going as well. Yeah, keep going. There's me thinking I could get a 10 minute break. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so I'll keep this section going then. Does anybody have any questions about MCF and the work that we do? Or any particular projects that I'd like to ask about? I'll give the space for this. I'd kind of like to know a little bit about the future in terms of ah. what your vision is and how you're going to get there. And, you know, you told us who your current members are. And um, I, I know a few of them, so, and a lot of them seem to have quite an international humanitarian um, base, but some of them will be domestic. And even the international ones, though, I know do some domestic stuff too. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd just like to know who, how you, you see it being in five or ten years, maybe. 
five or ten years. That's a fantastic question. And it's such an interview question, right? Where do you see yourself in five or ten years? This has been doing some interviews. Um, where I see Muslim charity for in the next five to ten years, I think an, an, an increase in both INGOs and NGO membership. Um, my particular role specializes in ensuring that there's a lot more NGOs involved. I think the smaller charities, the smaller social action groups really need to have their voices heard, as well as their capacity developed. And I think that's my mission. That's going to be my modus operandi for the next five, five, ten years, if I do manage to stay a part of this brilliant organization and continue the work. But in terms of, let's say, particular niches, I would like personally a lot more research and advocacy work to, um, to happen. Um, the Muslim community doesn't like talking about its, its issues. It likes to sort of suffer in silence. I'm not sure whether it actually likes to do that or it's just what it's gotten used to. But definitely with the new gen generation, this changing of socioeconomic um, contexts, you're going to be seeing a lot more Muslim social organisations actually come to the forefront talking about some of the challenges that they are facing and be a bit more vocal about maybe what's happening in the UK as well. And I think, I hope, I really do hope that the Muslim Charity Forum can lead the way and facilitate some of those conversations as well as give the voices to those who actually want to talk about those, those issues. Chris, does that help? Should I? Should I elaborate? Fantastic. Thank you. I'm interested in knowing more about members too. For example, how many volunteers are involved with personal membership and in what ways, any contribution to the community? We're going to get to that. We're going, we're going to get to that, Nikki. Just, just hold on. Do um, you think there should be an organization for Muslim volunteers agencies as well? Yes, um, it's actually something that we are working on. Um, behind the scenes. So thank you, Chris, for just exposing that accidentally. But yeah, I think as Muslim Charities Forum, one of the conversations that we are having, should there be a representative group or representative organization that champions Muslim volunteering? And that's their sole focus. And that, that is definitely something that maybe MCF should be leading on, or at least facilitating the conversations for. Um, it is definitely after joining Vision for Volunteering, we realise that, look, there's actually a lot of work to, to be done here. And I actually thank Vision for Volunteering for sort of stimulating that that um, that um, drive. And it's something that I'm, I'm grateful for. But yeah, Chris, what, what did you have in mind? What would that look like for you? Now, now that's an interview question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just It just strikes me that the, the, there's such a community. And obviously, as you, you've already said, a uh, uh, um, a, a, a faith-based history of giving both time and money within the community, uh, and and volu Muslim volunteers obviously are volunteering for non-Muslim charities as well as Muslim charities, and I, I think particularly given going back to the beginning around um, equity and inclusion in volunteering across the sector, there's something really to be gained by this maybe the solidarity but also building a community of people who want to give their time and and somehow building connectors and then from that building data which probably will help improve the experience so i don't i know this is off my head stuff but it just feels like there is a space for that actually there's probably a space for volunteers across you know regardless of faith coming together as an organization yeah. as well as the whole other subject but it just feels to me that there's um there's more potential within uh, Muslim communities, you know. So yeah, um, I, yeah I'd, I'd love to explore that if there was an opportunity, but uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I, I, I encourage think, you to for sure. <laughs> I think faith in general is one of those in interesting things. I think um, NCVO recently done the time of spent report, right? And that really uncovered some of the thoughtfuls as well as some of the strengths of volunteering in the UK. But one of the things that I think that they discovered is that um, ethnic community communities. Um, don't have a good experience in volunteering as much when compared to the general population. And um, I'm, I would say I agree with that sentiment. Um, when I've volunteered for, let's say, uh, non-faith organisations, there hasn't there wasn't really much regard for what we needed, whether it be prayer spaces, prayer times, accommodation, so those sort of sensitive sensitivities. It wasn't there. And I don't think this was out of a malicious intent. It was just 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 ignorance. Just, just, just ignorance or organizing meetings in places where maybe I would be reluctant to attend, or um, being in sort of environments where I wouldn't be comfortable with someone, someone of faith, or being in, involved in conversations or projects that involve, let's say, alcohol, for example, right? Uh, like a lobbying campaign for like a uh, a, a alcohol union or some sort of uh, company that sort of needs some sort of public advocacy work done. 
uh, yeah, I just wouldn't feel comfortable with that. And then what ends up happening is that, oh, you don't want to take part? Yeah, not a problem at all. But then you stop receiving messages, you stopped um, having conversations. It's like, it becomes taboo to talk about. And then you want to voice the concerns, well, who do you raise the concern to, right? And I think maybe having an organization that specializes just for that, so the Muslim volunteers, yeah, it may be something to um, consider. And I think as MC, we're working on like campaigns, but having an actual organization, that could be that could be tough. It's already tough managing sixteen core members. <laughs> now imagine managing around four hundred fifty small ones. Ooh, that could definitely be a challenge. But yeah, nothing's impossible as long as there's a drive and the resources and the right people to pull, pull it off. Nothing is impossible. Um, any other questions? Any other uh, information you'd like to find out that's maybe not be on our website? So, for example, um, talk about I can talk about the Muslim Chinese Convention that um, took took place a couple of weeks ago. We had about 300 people turn up. We had the Charity Charity Commission there. It was a quite an interesting event. We managed to find out quite a bit. Does anybody have any questions regarding that? Or any of our recent publications? Where would I be the where would I be the British Charitable Giving Report or Neighbours Next Door or Building Bridges of Hope? Any of those reports? Oh, no more questions, I'm assuming. The silence is a no. Okay, let's move on. Part two. Part two. So, Muslim volunteering. What is volunteering for Muslims? Why does it matter to us? Where does that sort of urge to volunteer begin? So, why volunteering matters for us as people of faith. And this is one of my favorite quotes, which is found in Sahih at Tabari. Um, this is a, a hadith, this is a saying of our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. All human beings, you are taught by God voluntarily. You must teach others volunteer. And I think this is very important. Um, God, we believe, didn't give us anything because he owes us something. He gave it voluntarily. And I think this point is very important because as Muslims, we give for the sake of giving, genuinely. And we seek the reward of our giving in our here, hereafter. Um, we don't do it for any sort of material gain and some of some of us do. Some, 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 of, some of us do, right? To get on their CV that they went for this organization, I became a trustee here. But I would say majority of the people of faith, in particular Muslims, do it genuinely for being Muslim. And it's a part of our cultural, social DNA. And the volunteering is actually embedded in Islamic texts as a result of certain concepts found in primary Islamic texts that have been in the Quran for us, as well as our Sunnah, which is part of um, what, what Tabari is. Um, the Quranic portrayal of humans as first gerent seats, custodians on earth who are responsible for the well-being of everything and everyone on earth. Um, this in turn has meant that volunteering is, you know, is, is not separate from our faith. If volunteering is something that we do as an attachment. It is very much a part of being Muslim and has played a significant role in serving humanity and being a part of voluntary action. Um, and it's very important. Um, volunteering is one of those things that can actually bring a community together, where you bring your mother, your father, and everybody gets together, which is quite rare to do, especially in this day and age where everything's a hustle and bustle. Oh, I haven't got time to do this. I haven't got time to time to do that. It gives a mode. It gives a medium for families to get together. It gives time for people that haven't seen each other in a long time to, to, to get together. And we hear this in Ramadan quite a bit. In Ramadan, you'll see people that you haven't seen for years at times come together and talk about matters. Or, you know, this is happening in, in Africa. This is happening in Asia. This is happening in the Middle East. What can we do about it? And many of these conversations happen just over a cup, cup of tea, just literally volunteers of the faith coming together and talking about some of the issues that they're facing. And this is what volunteering could look like. It could be two uncles helping each other walk, walk, walk to the mosque, one being younger than the other, just carrying him. Or it could be a young girl helping out a refugee girl, right? Playing, giving her toys, sharing, and volunteering her time as her parents brought her to the mosque or brought her to the community center where there are refugees also there. Or it could be helping out needy in an open kitchen in a soup kitchen in some sort of um, social action project you may recognize this guy here uh, that's me handed out some, some foods to um, um, people in Hounslow in our, one of our members um, soup kitchen which is in Austin Hans um, it's a great place honestly uh, when I went there I was expecting people to just be giving out food 
but it turned out it was a community hut um, where people were receiving shoes, people were receiving clothes, and people were actually being found jobs. It was absolutely fantastic. And everyone there is a volunteer, other than the site manager and his head, head of admin, the entire team are just volunteers. And a lot of the people who are now volunteers are people that used to be helped out. So a lot of the beneficiaries that used to receive help from the soup, soup kitchen actually ended up coming to volunteers for that soup kitchen, which just goes to show you that sort of that cycle of giving gives back. So if I was to sort of break up um, what the British Muslim sort of charity and sector looks like, I would say on the one end, you have your large INGOs who are 10 million pound plus. On the other hand, you have a very large number of organizations that are small under 500k, or the majority are under 100k. And you've got sort of the INGOs that are in, in between that sort of 10 million and 500k, and then have NGOs in between. But what we really see a, a lack of are large scale NGOs in the UK. I think there's a national challenge. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, honestly, they're, they're, they are fantastic. They are fantastic. They're one of our most important members, and I really enjoy working with them. But we don't have any large organizations. So even to track his forum, we're under 500k. Um, we're not really heavily funded, and um, a lot of the work that we do is voluntary as well. So we have uh, the core team, and then we also have a voluntary team that helps us out in certain projects, uh, whether it be advocacy, whether it be certain events. They come together and they help us out. Um, but we actually done research into this chunk here, and we found around 450 organizations there. 45% um, of them were women-led, and there's always that sort of thinking that, oh, Muslims and women, it doesn't work, and they're oppressed. But 45% of these organizations, charities, CICs, are female-led, and that, that's that just like shocks me personally speaking. If I was to just reveal some other some of the other statistics, sixty eight percent of the volunteers, so sixty eight percent of the organizations, organizations, staff members, sixty eight percent of them are volunteers. Now forty two percent of them are no paid paid staff. So the sixty eight volunteers per organizations and forty two percent of them being no, they're not paid. That was a statistic for me I was shocked by because we as a community are always represented as, you know, um, we are A, B, or C. But when we actually look at the, with the work that we do, we don't shout about it, we don't scream about it, but I think the proof is in the pudding, as, as they say, right? We don't need that sort of, we don't need to show off and say, this is what we're doing, this is what we do. We just do the work. And having an organized 68 volunteers per organization on, on average is remarkable. Um, if you see some of these WhatsApp chats and these WhatsApp groups that some of these ladies have founded, it's fantastic. And it also gets doubled up as like a marriage net network as well. So it's, it's quite interesting how these sort of volunteer, volunteer group chats can be multi multi purpose. And having organizations where 42%, almost half of your, or your workforce being unpaid staff, it just really goes to show that sort of impetus to just help out people and be a part of doing good. And I think that's what uh, being a Muslim is. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. My organization reflect that. Are you shocked by these, by the way? Just a little uh, a question here. Are you shocked? Not really. What do you guys think? Not really. Chris, thank you very much, man. <laughs> Anyone else? Anybody else? Any have any opinions? Anything they want to share? I suppose I would say um, it's when you see everything pulled together that's where it becomes surprising, and you're seeing mm -hmm. sort of the the impact of that information all collated. Yeah, that it it just shows the the power of it. So yep. it's not so much surprise because I know I think we know all of this goes on in our communities, but it's when you pull it all together and that collective kind of statistic is really yeah, impressive. Yeah. Definitely. So this um, Bridges of Hope report is one of my um, Bibles at MCF. I would highly recommend anybody that wants to find out more about these local organizations, have a read of this. And this was just a shallow dive. It wasn't really a deep dive. Um, we're working on really um, getting to the nitty gritty of it, but this will require a good three to five years of deep investigation into what Muslims around the UK are, are doing. Um, 
um, in Ramadan, um, we had a, a call um, from an organization that was working in, it was near Manchester, but it was Manchester, it was just on the outskirts of, of a hotel filled with refugees, and they had no access to any sort of uh, religious um, equipment as well as some, some sort of facilities, right? There were no Qurans, there were no hijabs, there were no... And this is the height of Ramadan, right in the middle, of it, where people are, you know, really want to exert that sort of uh, religious activity and have access to it. And we just called up one of the local mosques up in Manchester. And within 24 hours, we had about 200 Qurans delivered, hijabs delivered, any sort of like any of their needs taken care of. And it was literally just a phone call. I called, called up the guy and said, look, bro, this is the situation. Can you help? I said, of course, no worries at all. And they, somebody drove from his mosque to where the refugees were, and it was like a two and a half hour drive. And it wasn't even, a cost was covered by them. Everything was covered by them. Everything was just sort of dropped off. And I see that in, in action, you know, it, 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 it brought tears to my eyes, to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, I've just been given a warning that I've got 10 minutes left, so I have to just carry on. I can't be too emotional and too happy about this. Cool, fantastic. Break or continue? I think we're going to continue. The vision. So why are we a part of Vision for Volunteering? Well, it all started off with a message from one of our members who just sent me this said, vision of volunteering. How does volunteering need to adapt by 2032? I thought to myself, what is this? Why are we talking about 2032? I was, I, was, I was a bit thrown off, to be honest with you. Join the movement to create a more diverse and innovative um, voluntary space. And I thought, okay, this sounds quite interesting. It was actually sent from one of our members as well. And uh, this person himself, he's a volunteering specialist and volunteering in particular is something very, very important to him. But um, we went on the website, we saw a couple of, a couple of familiar faces and we thought, you know, this is, wow, this is a hefty vision and it's a 10 year vision. It's something, it's got really interesting values, really interesting themes, and um, we wanted to find out more. So after a few communications, after our applications, we became a member. And we believe in these values and these themes 100%. Awareness and appreciation, power, equity and inclusion, collaboration, experimentation. These are, th are things we, we believe that every volunteer should have access to. For me personally, in particular, experimentation is, uh, is a um, special one. Is something that I haven't seen other um, volunteer champions discuss, where volunteers are given the chance to experiment and try things. Um, usually volunteers are, are just admins or they're the rubbish collectors or they're the um, chair stackers. But I think pushing a, a value and a vision where volunteers have a chance to experiment and try new things, it's actually very, very, uh, it's actually it's quite unprecedented. And the fact that we're a part of a vision that sort of championing that, I'm really happy, happy for. Um, equity and inclusion, I don't think I need to um, discuss that, go into any further information. I think we all understand the importance of equity and inclusion, collaboration, the same. The one is an appreciation, yes, exactly what, what Georgia said. It's not just about just giving them gift cards. It's about actually celebrating what they do, celebrating the fact that they are volunteering their time. It's voluntary, and they're not just giving their finances, they're giving their time. Time is one of the resources. You're, time is the only resource you're never going to get back. Money, you can always get back. You can always, you know, find like somebody can always enumerate you different ways. But time, giving time to something you never want to get back and actually empowering them. And, and I think all these values combined leads to an empowerment of volunteers. And um, before I end it, I'd like to share this quote with you. Yeah, time is perishable. Um, it's from my heroes, um, Muhammad Ali. Um, he said, the service you do for others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. And um, yeah, that's something that resonates with me um, quite, quite, quite a bit. Um, where we believe um, we are really religious people. We didn't ask to be given eyes. We didn't get asked to give in legs and arms and, and function and organs. This was given to us voluntarily. Uh, and it's a real honor to be given. So it's an honor to be a human being. It's an honor to be a Muslim. It's an honor to be a part of British civil society. And it's something that was just given to us. We didn't ask for it. And um, it's only it's only right that we help out other people in, in the UK and across the world. And I think volunteering is uh, the back and bone of that sort of structure and that help. Thank you very much. Over to you, Georgia. Thank you so much, Faris. That was really, really great. I found out a lot and really Pleasure. enjoyed it. And I hope everybody did too. Um, I think we've got 
maybe three or four minutes if we've got any questions. I think he's on a conversation if there's anything you want to talk about, maybe. I don't mind for another eight minutes. <laughs> And what I'm also going to do just before we go um, is pop in the chat when I can find it because it's just appeared off of my screen. There you are. Uh, we've just got a feedback form. Um, if you could just take a couple of minutes while you're here to just let us know how you found the session today, um, what you learned and how you got on. That would be really, really helpful for us uh, for our events moving forward. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. If anyone's got any questions, now's the time. If anyone wants to talk about anything, um, a copy of the slides would be amazing. Absolutely. Yes, if you... I can send those out, um, or Barish, if you want to send those over to me, um, and I'll make those available to everybody who registered. That would be great. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everybody. It's been fab. So if, I don't know if you want to take a couple of minutes to just go through the um, the feedback form. That would be fab. And anyone wants to ask any questions, you can go right ahead. And if not, then just another thank you from me and Barish for coming along. And I hope you enjoyed. And um, please do follow along with the Vision for Volunteering on social media. Uh, sign up for our newsletter. Um, to see what we're up to. That would be great. Thanks, guys. And if anybody has any questions, I'll pop my email into the chat. Or the, I don't know if I'm going to I think I'll just send it to you, Georgia. You can add it to the chat. chat. So if anybody wants to reach out to me, have any questions, anything they want to talk about, please do reach out. Um, I'm quite accessible. Well, thank I you very much for the questions, guys. Honestly. Oh, um, can I just ask a quick question in terms of the, the key parts of the vision? Are there any that you th that feel really strongly about that you can take forward, or any that you feel might be a bit more challenging for you know for me, for reason? Yeah, for me, I think experimentation uh, is is really really key. I've been a volunteer for a number of organisations. I think experimentation, like I said, is one of the niches that the vision has actually highlighted. Which I found that other organisations don't. Giving volunteers the room to to um, try things, be a part of different projects, and even within our internships, so we see our internship as an extension of our sort of volunteering. And we actually give our interns the chance to be a part of projects and actually lead projects, which is um, actually quite rare to find in our sector. Usually volunteers are usually the, the, the bucket holders or they are the, you know, the chair stackers or they're the mic people or they're the people with the donation forms running around when they collect donations. But we believe that it should be more than that. They should be actually be integrated. They shouldn't just be called for for events. Be a part of actually what you guys are building, uh, and I think that's something that is. I think MCF is in a unique space as well. At the same time, right? And we are a collective of charities, and we do um, interesting work where other organisations might not be doing the kind of work that we're doing, where it just requires man manpower. And that's what obviously separates us as MCF, where we get to bring different organisations together from different volunteers. So we don't have one fleece or one hoodie. That, that you wear, so you're not a part of this charity and you can't be a part of any other charity. No, we're the collective voice. I think that experimentation comes with the power, though, doesn't it? You know, if you get yeah. the power bit right, you get the experimentation. That's what your co production that you're talking about is really, really key. And I think that's a tr that's a challenge for the whole sector for sure. And I know some people doing it really well. You know, I was up uh, a year or so up at nothing to do with Islam, but I was at um, the um, uh, what's the football club who was set up by the people who were protests against Manchester United? Um, I forgot the name, but FC United. Um, I was actually blown away by that club. You know, just nothing to do with volunteering or even to do with, I suppose, nothing to do with charity, but a club that was actually built by a community who just got on with everybody, everything. And and it was a whole thing was from the buildings to the policy to, to, to part, I don't mean they picked the players, but everything else was kind of done by co-production across the organisation. And I, and it is, I don't know, if anybody's up in Manchester, go and have a look, invite yourself along. It's astonishing, but, you know, it, but it comes from actually an ethos and a culture of giving people power and actually listening to your volunteers as stakeholders and members and, and part of the community. And surely the, you know, the, the strength of the Muslim community, that should be something that can really flourish. Yeah, I do, I do, I do hope so. I think there are some exemplars within our community and there are they are our community champions. Definitely a lot more can be done. I think we have, it's, it's very interesting times that we are living in uh, with the cost of living crisis and the number of crises. Mm -hmm. Like we're really seeing volunteer fatigue. Uh, but um, there's something about being a person of faith, I guess that there's that little bit of a, that extra gear 
So who's, who's, who's going to buy their own custard creams? Someone will volunteer from our community to, to go and grab them. Who's going to get the biscuits? Who's going to get the, get the own teas? Um, and these little things make uh, make a difference, especially when resources are tight, right? Where, I don't know, but whenever I see like uh, like biscuits that are like um, offshoots of brands, that are like the fake brands, it really annoys me. And there's like that one volunteer who gets the actual digestives. <laughs> that really makes me happy. That person needs to be celebrated. <laughs> Brilliant. I don't, I, I don't know about if there are, but um, and there must be, I'm sure. But are, are there Muslim charities getting very involved in the sort of green environmental movement? Are yeah, there any so sort of big as, movers as in MCF, that? we actually have a climate need. Um, what we want to do is make people more climate aware. Um, I wish I had more time to actually discuss this. Yeah, we've got two minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll email you. I'll email you. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> well, honestly, I think because climate is a really, really big one. So a lot of the um, impacts of climate change will be impacting in some majority countries, right? Whether it be in, in East Africa or be Southeast Asia. And it's something that's really dear to us. Um, and you see some of the efforts that are being done in Indonesia and Malaysia. So there's good work being done. It's just not being talked about. Or well, it's such such that um, Muslims in the UK, maybe in particular, haven't got the time to actually talk about climate issues, which is something that we've actually um, did, did, did discovered. Where we're so busy working. We're so busy looking after our families or keeping that community going. That climate right now is is on the backbone, mm -hmm. but there's going to come a time where I think it's definitely going to be championed. And there are some organisations leading that. Like Islamic Relief is really big, Human Appeal, Muslim Hands. They have very niche climate projects that they do across the globe. But in the UK, um, the activity isn't there as much. Islamic Relief also has a project with mosques, making mosques more eco friendly. I'm not sure if you know the Cambridge Mosque is, is one of the only eco-friendly mosques in, uh, I think it's the first eco-friendly mosque in Europe, something along those lines that has that sort of, um, uh, that, 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 that sort of credit. It's something that's very interesting. I would highly advise looking at it. But yeah, if, any sort of conversation you guys want to have offline, please let me know. I'm happy. Thanks ever so much. I'll still certainly drop your line. Pleasure. Pleasure. It's a pleasure being here, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. I hope you have a great Thank rest you. of your Monday and a great rest of your week. Thank you so much. Awesome, I think that went really well. Yeah, I, I think that was uh, that was just how how did you find it? Sorry? How how did you find it? Was it, it was, was great, it? yeah, it was really okay, engaging. Fantastic. It was really, really good. And everyone was okay, participating great. and asking questions, it was fab. I hope it wasn't boring. No, not at all. It's really good. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay, um any sort of feedback from me? Anything from